Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the regional session. We're delighted to bring you this session focused on how DNA is used by law enforcement and crime labs to solve crime. We are very privileged today to have Professor Adrian Lineker to be our chair for this session. At the end of all presentations, there will be an opportunity for us to answer some of your questions. But in the meantime, you can definitely just submit all your questions in the Q&A box below. As a reminder, this session offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow that process to obtain your credits. At that top right section, you, you can also find the complete bios of our speakers there. So without further ado, let me pass the ball to Professor Adrian Lineker, who will start chairing the session. Adrian, please. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, welcome all, welcome all. Now we actually have three excellent speakers in the lead of their field, mass parallel sequencing and rapid DNA. Now their biographies are available. I'm not going to do anything like that. I don't want to eat into their times any more than they need to be. Um, and as, as uh, Beatrice says, we're going to leave all the questions till the end, but please start putting your questions. I will see them on my screen, so I'll get involved with them, and we can put those to the speakers right at the end. The first speaker is a, a recorded talk um, on their use of rapid DNA in particular. Fascinating work that they're doing in field testing. So without further ado, can we have a talk? So in conjunction with rapid DNA testing, we also try to target rapid samples. What I mean by this is samples that are readily accessible and present in highly decomposed remains and easy to collect. We also sought sample types that would not only be easy to collect and sample, but would, also, but would allow a minimal sample preparation. So these factors led us to samples like nail, uh, tissue biopsy, hair, uh, and small bones. By choosing samples such as these, we negate the need for a more invasive, labor-intensive sample collection, such as for FEMA, uh, followed by extensive preparation and processing steps. Having introduced some of the sample types, I'll now address exactly what I mean about minimal preparation. Really, it addresses both the collection and sample preparation. In terms of sample collection, the samples can be collected by simply picking up or cutting. In terms of preparation prior to the DNA processing, um, I refer to avoiding things such as repeated washing steps and incubations, because these are the things that add time to what might be defined as rapid processing. Therefore, by using these sample types, our sample preparation can be as simple as cutting off excess swab shaft, cutting nail into smaller pieces, rinsing debris such as soil or decomposition fluid off with water, wrapping biopsy tissue around a swab, cutting FTA card containing biological material, or directly adding bone shavings into the chamber. The rapid hit ID system uses a primary cartridge, which is where the sample is added. Uh, one cartridge holds and tests one sample, taking approximately 90 minutes. Note that the sample chamber itself is long and narrow, and that's it's because it's designed for a swab, where the swab containing the, the actual biological material is down the bottom. So here, 300 microliters of lysis buffer is added and then removed from the sample chamber before proceeding for direct PCR. So now, as forensic scientists, uh, we're always trying to see what we can get away with, usually on something that works perfectly fine the way it was actually designed to. But uh, we know we have a long, narrow chamber where we can insert our sample and where our lysis buffer enters. Our sample on the left is perhaps uh, more of an ideal sample amount or volume. Conversely, on the right, we have 500 milligrams of bone powder, which is simply too much sample for a few reasons. Uh, we're able to still include a swab in the chamber with the sample on the left, and that swab actually assists in holding the sample down when the lysis buffer comes into the chamber. This can help with the submersion of the sample. We recovered partial uh, global father express profiles for most of our different sample types. However, the format and amounts of the different samples varied. While we did recover a partial profile with bone shavings, this was only able to be achieved on one sample. Our nail and tissue biopsy samples seemed to work somewhat consistently. 
Um, but while we would still seek to determine the optimum amount of sample, we found that mostly at least one of nail or tissue biopsy from the same individual would yield a partial profile. Testing these uh, types of samples means we're making them be compatible with the sample cartridge. Uh, so for starters, we could just find a way to use a swab as the system has been designed to do, but we can just incorporate the swab. So the best example here is the tissue biopsy. We were wrapping the tissue around the swab head, uh, which gives maximum surface area exposure to the lysis buffer, making that interaction as efficient as possible. Another thing we saw was a sample moving around in the sample chamber. So while the swab can hold or, or pin the sample down, sample substrate can be moved due to the injection of the lysis buffer. Efficient, efficient lysis is achieved by the interaction with the substrate. So if it's moving in the chamber, that lysis may not be sufficient. Occasionally when pulling out the cartridge at the end of a run, we actually saw nail clippings or similar floating on top. The optimal amount of sample material does need to be determined whether it's on a swab or in the chamber. It is possible that less may be more. Uh, we only have that 300 microliters of lysis buffer, so it needs to interact optimally with the sample substrate. Obviously, 300 microliters of lysis buffer has no chance against 500 milligrams of bone powder. And, and finally, I just mentioned the direct PCR action may mean we're more susceptible to inhibitors with these sample types. Uh, sample types like bone contain inhibitors, and we have other inhibitors in the form of decomposition byproducts or soil. Uh, we may need to balance this with a quick cleanup. So, in the case of the bone shavings, it appeared that they absorbed the lysis buffer, ultimately leading to a failed analysis. Uh, this is further complicated when too much bone is used. Uh, in the case of dirty samples causing inhibition or clogged capillaries, an error notice will appear, uh, but it can be as simple as running a blank in between to make sure there are no issues with carryover. In the event of a failed analysis, it can be difficult to distinguish between no or low DNA um, or inhibition, and, and this these would, would usually guide further testing. Um, I guess finally I'd say that the, the variability of a DVI means that samples even of the same type can be dramatically different. We saw that nails, for example, can be clean, covered in decomposition fluid or attached to tissue, and often even missing by the time an individual got to the temporary mortuary. So now I'll pass on to Ali to, to continue. Thanks, Jeremy. So I'm just going to provide a few general comments and observations for the field deployment of rapid DNA. Um, and, and realistically, it, it, this exercise has been of great benefit towards this. And I know there are other validation, um, so there is other validation work going on around the globe towards this. However, in relation to this exercise, system validation must be conducted to ensure there is confidence in the outcomes. And this relates not to just technical in-lab um, validation, but very relevant on um, operational deployed environment. Uh, the workflow de development to integrate sampling process at earliest opportunity. So that this is related to the integration into the field ID process, and it's very important that this is done well to ensure you get early returns. Connectivity. Um, connectivity could be important. It is possible to have this back-to-base scenario, especially where you might find results uh, interpretation uh, might be very complex and require uh, a scientific expert who may not be present in the field, and that can be advantageous. And clear result representation. It's very important those results that are provided are not so scientifically focused, um, rather have the ability to provide that matching information to a lay person. Speed versus outcomes. So a fast turnaround time may not equal a usable result or a usable outcome. Readjust and align quality standards specifically for rapid DNA, including our scientific result expectation. This is a question that I would like to pose and for, for people to have some thought around. I think it's important um, to consider that maybe deeper relevant validation for the confidence in outcomes and, and that maybe scientists should consider concessions in their expectations from a laboratory-based model 
um, towards a more a modified rapid DNA technical model. And, and that is something to, to seriously think about. If we think about the rapid DNA legislation in the US, um, it won't allow uploads to CODIS due to there no, being no quantitation step. Um, so, you know, changing our expectations and um, without compromise on standards of result, of course, there is that balance. Um, it could help to address this. And also, consider integration with smart software potentially for a faster and more robust interpretation. And that can take a lot of that um, scientific um, hard work in, into those complex results that can take some of that away. So in general, with a field deployment, um, a usable, easy platform for quick setup, minimal intervention. So the placement of the unit on scene is important and will maximise its integration in the DVI process and impact on the timing of um, potentially uh, either repatriation or identification of remains. And that leads into sample throughput per run is important. So whether that unit has one channel that runs per time, um, sorry, per you know, 90 minutes, um, or you have a, a series of individual single units which can run simultaneously, or the one instrument, as I say, that could have, say, six to eight samples or more um, at any one time. Um, so thinking a little bit out of the box, it doesn't have to be that one unit, it could be several. Training. Training is very important. Um, there is a, a, a non-CODIS um, rapid DNA considerations and best practices paper um, specifically being developed for law enforcement. It is US based in, in relation to the Rapid DNA Act. However, it, it's, not a, it's quite a good paper. It talks about that importance of, of training um, your non-scientific personnel. The environmental impact is challenging in a DVI. And in this exercise, it was very challenging. It was that four seasons in one day. We went from extreme heat, dust, to uh, storms, uh, torrential rain, electrical storms, and mud, copious mud. So from the heat to the humidity to the dry, it is important that these platforms and their consumables can actually cope with the variation in that environmental um, uh, challenges. So adaptability is key and, and I stick to this, there is no room for princess platforms and consumables. They cannot be requiring you know, a, a temperate climate to perform adequately. These systems need to be able to adapt uh, in, in order for us to maximise their um, integration into the field, into field deployment, especially for scenes like this. So in conclusion, the rapid hit ID system demonstrated its utility for assisting with the rapid on-site identification and reassociation of human remains at a mass fatality incident and in a remote environment by both DNA specialists and police users. A range of different post-mortem sample types can be applied to the rapid hit ID system, but further optimization is recommended for highly decomposed and skeletonized human remains. Definitely having a rapid platform on scene for faster development of DNA results is highly beneficial. However, the simplicity of platform use does not translate to simplicity of results for scene work, and that's something to remember. Requires ruggedization for true field deployment, platform and consumables. The validation of system technical limits and support workflows is necessary for confidence in outcomes when working in field, and whether that be a lay person interpreting or a scientific staff member uh, <clears throat> reporting. Thank you. So, in the interest of time, we have Romani Amana Tharaman. I really apologise if I'm not pronounced your name correctly. Right, now we're talking about mass power sequencing next on how that would happen in um, looking at geographical and ancestry markers. The biography of Am uh, Dr. Ramani is online anyway, so without further ado, please take the floor. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for joining in on this virtual conference. My name is Ramani and I have been a forensic scientist with the DNA Profiling Laboratory at Health Sciences Authority in Singapore for eight years. Today, I will be talking on the topic, 
doing more with less. But first, a disclaimer. Before I start on today's topic for sharing, I would like to give a short introduction to who we are and what we do. We are the sole national accredited forensic DNA laboratory in Singapore. We have been accredited with ASPLAT Lab since 1996 and recently transitioned over to ANAB. As part of the human identification services we provide to law enforcement, our standard DNA profiling workflow involves semi-automated extraction using Promega IQ chemistry on the Maxwell FSC, quantitation using Quantifiler Duo on the Quant Studio 7, PCR using Global Filer on the Proflex, and capillary electrophoresis on the 24 cap 3500 XL. We then issue our final reports, which are then tendered in court. Here are a selection of our publications and procedures we have developed or validated for use in casework. For investigative purposes, we used emergent technologies which have the potential, but we feel are not yet ready for use in court. We have both massively parallel sequencing platforms in place and use them for prediction of biogeographic ancestry External, externally visible phenotypes, and whole genome mitochondrial DNA sequencing. We use the Kaigen Pyromark for pyrosequencing to predict age by looking at the proportion of methylation at three predictors, ELOF L2, TRIM59, and KLF14. We have also validated the use of the rapid hit system for urgent cases back in 2015. In forensic casework, the samples that we deal with are mostly compromised with questionable quality and typically very limited quantities. The forensic community is continuously working to address these limitations. In line with this, we are currently evaluating the new Promega Bone DNA Kit. It has shown promising results for use with difficult body remain samples such as those seen in DVI situations. However, this will not be the focus of today's sharing. The basis of doing more with less relates to being able to get more value, more data, more savings in terms of cost and our time with less input. Today, I will be sharing with you two methods which we have developed to be able to do more with less. I will start off with microflock direct amplification first. The Copen microflock direct swab is one which was specially designed for direct sampling and amplification. What is special about this micro swab is its small nylon fiber tip, which has been pre treated to allow for in situ lysis. It also has a breakage point to allow the tip to be snapped off directly into a PCR tube or plate for direct PCR amplification. We use the microflock swab by lightly moistening the tip with deionized water, applying the swab perpendicularly to the stain in question, giving the swab a few twists, and then returning the swab to its holder. Subsequently, the swab head is snapped off into a PCR tube containing the global filer master mix and processed as per our standard workflow. Given the small size of the nylon fiber tip, you can see how little sample is consumed, thus leaving sufficient sample for subsequent testing. The benefits that this method of sampling and direct amplification has offered are multifold. As mentioned, there is minimal sample consumption with sufficient sample left for subsequent testing. It is an easy to do procedure with almost no additional training, no additional equipment, and easily integrated in our existing workflow. 
because we are skipping the extraction and quantitation steps, we are able to turn around results in three hours, which is especially useful for urgent cases. Furthermore, unlike rapid DNA systems, which use either one, three, five, or seven sample cartridges, and any additional samples would, re would mean additional 90 minutes or under two hour runs, again, depending on which rapid DNA system you're talking about, the use of microflock direct amplification allows us to process up to 20 samples and controls in the 24 cap CE system to be run in the same three hours. This is also cheaper than standard processing by 14% and up to 20 times cheaper per sample compared to rapid DNA systems. Some laboratories would have concerns with direct amplification due to requirements for consensus-based reporting of mixed DNA profiles, or with capillary electrophoresis artifacts due to over-amplification. We too had these issues and sought to see how we could improve on this method. To address these concerns, we realized we needed to generate a lysate. So, Instead of snapping the microflock head into a tube containing our master mix, it went into some low TE buffer and a short incubation later to allow the lysed cell contents to enter the buffer. This provided us with sufficient volume for multiple amplifications using global filer and the option of varying the amount of lysed state used for amplification. We evaluated this modification with blood stained on a wide variety of substrates and reported on the performance of this. Well, I'm sorry about that. We seem to have uh, frozen technology. Um, I'm sure we can catch back to um, Dr. Amani in due course, but rather than just staring at a frozen screen, We've cut in to Luke, the next talker, who seems to be ready to take on the slack at very short notice. Is that OK with you, Luke? Yep. Yes, I'm ready. Well, take the floor. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I'm uh, presenting on a research project that I completed recently. Uh, assessing a massively parallel sequencing as an investigative, investigative tool. So the intent of the research uh, was to collaborate with Queensland Police Service, with the detectives, and they're our end users. So we wanted to collaborate with them to assess uh, the MPS. Uh, we assessed both biogeographic ancestry and hair and eye colour externally visible characteristics. And the assessment, we assessed in terms of operational effectiveness. So we wanted to determine how could that MPS uh, assist a, a, a real investigation in Queensland. Uh, my intention was if we had positive findings to use the findings of this research as a justification uh, in, a, in a business case for instrument purchase and also to use this model of uh, assessing operational effectiveness with the end users as a model for assessing future panels. So what did we actually do? Uh, the extraction and DNA quantification we performed in Queensland in, in uh, our forensic labs there. Uh, and we traveled to Melbourne to the Thermo Fisher uh, labs to do the NPS analysis. Uh, we used the precision ID ancestry uh, panel, the commercial panel, and the DNA phenotyping uh, community panel. And we processed that on the uh, Ion Chef and the uh, S5XL. So what methodology did we use? We selected four real Queensland cases. And I think it's, uh, it's important to, to emphasise this was deliberate because we wanted to use real Queensland cases so that our assessment was as close as possible to uh, a, a real life situation uh, and a real investigation. We conducted NPS analysis only of the offender reference samples. We didn't process any crime scene samples because we didn't want to unnecessarily consume those. 
Uh, we used those results uh, and, and interpreted the NPS results to prepare intelligence reports, which were presented to the detectives. Uh, we collected uh, mugshot photographs of each of the offenders uh, and the, all of the POIs from the cases and their physical descriptions. And we had, for some of the, uh, some of the uh, POIs, we have multiple uh, mugshots that had been collected over, over years. And it was interesting to note that some of the physical descriptions weren't consistent with their, with their mugshots. And then we conducted workshops in person with the detectives. So as I said, we selected real cr Queensland criminal cases and we used a number of criteria to select these cases. Uh, we wanted large numbers of persons of interest because this is one of the applications of MPS to prioritise those large lists of, uh, of POIs. We wanted POIs with a range of appearances and ancestries and this is what we could use to actually prioritise that list, the differences in their appearance and ancestries. We obviously we needed a good quality photograph for each of the POIs um, and we wanted to keep things as real as possible. We wanted to have offender DNA located at the crime scene and obviously we needed that reference sample of the offender uh, to actually process. So just, a, 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 I guess, a broad overview of the cases that we used. These are the four cases that we analysed. The first was uh, eight linked sexual offences and home invasions. We, these happened over a number of years, and for the for the uh, I guess the entire investigation, the, the offender was not uh, was an unknown offender, and there was a very large number of uh, POIs investigated for that investigation. The second was ten linked sexual offences over a shorter period of time, but still an unknown offender. Uh, the third was a murder of a female victim. Now this only had one POI, which was the offender. But we included this case because the offender was actually identified uh, using CCTV. So we wanted to see whether the detectives could use the NPS intelligence to compare that to the CCTV imagery. And the fourth and final one was the murder of a female victim. There were eight POIs and they were from a range of ancestries. So the actual workshops, what did we do? We had 28 police detectives who participated and the, the way that they flowed, we, we gave a case scenario. So we gave the background of the offence, the MO, and if there was multiple offences, we, we, gave, we gave that for each offence. Um, we gave the investigation history. So we walked the detectives through what the actual process that had been conducted for the investigation for each of the cases. We gave the DNA results, so the actual DNA results that were available. And then we inserted the NPS results in the form of, the, uh, of an intelligence report. I've got one of those I can show you. Uh, then we gave the uh, detectives all of the mugshots, so of the, all of the POIs and the offenders. Uh, obviously, we didn't identify who the offender was, and we asked them to use the intelligence reports to make include, exclude or unsure assessments on each of the POIs. So could those POIs be included or excluded using the intelligence report. And we also collected uh, a range of other metrics, which I'll describe. So this is an example of the intelligence reports that we, uh, that we generated. So at the top, we had some, uh, just some case details, sample details. And then in the results, we made two types of statements. So you can see at the bottom of the, the first page of this intelligence report, we made a series of likely statements. So, for example, for eye colour, we said that the donor is likely to have brown eyes. On the second page, for each of the ancestry hair colour, eye colour, we also made a series of not likely statements. So, again, for eye colour, we said that the donor is not likely to have blue or intermediate eyes. And these are the statements that the uh, detectives used to assess the, uh, the photographs of each of the POIs. And you'll note that we didn't give them the raw data, the raw NPS analysis data. So the metrics that we collected that we used to assess the operational effectiveness, uh, firstly, confidence. So what was the accuracy? How did the detectives rate the accuracy and the robustness of that intelligence? And what was their willingness to use the intelligence in an investigation? We asked them to rate their value so did they believe that the NPS intelligence had a positive 
or negative impact on the investigation? Would it direct it in, a, in an informative direction or would it mislead the, direct, the investigation? We assess their population group awareness. So for the ancestry root populations, what we did was for the likely statements, uh, we asked them to use a, we gave them a map of the world and some, and some colouring in pencils, and we asked them to circle the areas that they felt that were represented by the likely uh, uh, statements for the for ancestry. So if we said Europe, we asked them to colour in. If it was likely to have uh, European ancestry, we asked them to colour in those areas on the map. We looked at uh, whether the offender was included or excluded. Obviously, that's a key metric. Um, and then we looked at the percentage of POIs that were excluded. So the results. Uh, confidence. Two-thirds of the, of the detectives, and this is a summary of, for each of the cases, um, two-thirds assessed their confidence as greater than 50%. And this was, again, a measure of how they felt, how accurate and robust they thought the intelligence was and what was their willingness to use it. So you can, you can see there, there was a level of confidence there that it could be used. And I, I guess I should say that all of these detectives, no, none of them had previous experience with MPS. So I would be concerned if they had a very high level of confidence in, in, in uh, MPS because of, its, because of its intelligence by its nature. Uh, value. So 90% of respondents accept it, assessed it as having positive value, which means, and we gave these descriptors on the response sheet, so they knew what they were, they knew what they were saying when they assessed the value. They, they felt that the MPS provided avenues for investigation and had the potential to indicate a suspect pool. So that was a positive that they felt that uh, it, it had a positive value. Population group awareness. Um, so th this is where we assessed their knowledge, their, their familiarity with the root populations provided in the, uh, in the ancestry results. Um, what we found broadly was they had a generally good idea of, of the root populations. And you can see we assessed whether they, had, uh, whether they fully indicated the correct area, whether there was partial, so they didn't include any incorrect areas, but partial with no errors, partial with errors and then fully incorrect. We didn't get any fully incorrect, but we saw some partial no errors. So for example, uh, if they were looking at the European area, they would exclude areas that they might only include parts of, of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, where we found the detectives um, had less familiarity was with Oceania, and with the Asian root populations. And I think that this, these results, and in speaking to the detectives in the workshop, these are the results that really reinforce the need for that trained forensic biologist to provide this, uh, the MPS intelligence to the detectives who have limited familiarity with it and to coach them through the process of how it can be used. Offender include, exclude. So we found that there was across the four cases there was only one instance uh, where one of the detectives excluded the offender. The exclusion was based on ancestry alone. Uh, and when we looked into that decision-making process, we found that that detective, uh, for case four, there was a group of four POIs who had the same ancestry and the same phenotypes, the same externally visible characteristics. And the detective used the intelligence to include two of those persons and exclude two. So it was a bit hard to understand the decision-making process that was used. And that's why I say if that's an example <clears throat> where that decision would be avoidable uh, with uh, uh, the forensic scientist assisting. The POI exclusion rate. So uh, overall averaged across the cases, we had about a 30% exclusion rate. So. And I think that this, um, sorry, I should say that that assessment was based on the overall assessment that we asked them to make. So for each, for each POI, we asked the uh, detectives to make individual assessments of whether they could include or exclude based on hair, eye and ancestry. And then we asked them to make a fourth assessment overall, taking into account each of those elements, what would, they, what would their final decision 
be. So they may include on hair and eye, exclude on ancestry, but their overall assessment may be to include. So that POI exclusion rate, we saw about a 30% exclusion rate, and that really reinforced the uh, utility of the MPS to um, prioritise large lists of POIs. So at the start of an investigation where there's uh, an unknown offender, big list of POIs, then this could be one of the tools that the detectives could use to uh, start prioritising that POI list. So the findings, I guess in summary, um, the confidence and value assessments really demonstrated that the detectives felt that the MPS intelligence had utility and they were willing to use it. Um, again, I stress that they didn't have prior experience with it. So the fact that they, they saw value in it with limited exposure, I thought was very promising. It was only one offender exclusion. Um, and I said, this was a critical metric, whether the offender was excluded, uh, because obviously if we exclude the offender, um, then that's very misleading for the investigation. Um, and that was that exclusion was non-intuitive. So that really reinforced the need for the trained forensic biologist to deliver uh, interpreted NPS results to the to the detectives and not not just provide the raw results to them. The the thirty percent POI exclusion rate really demonstrated the effectiveness for cases with a large suspect pool, or possibly if mass screenings are proposed. Um, it really demonstrates that. Um, the potential to uh, prioritise those uh, suspect lists to cut down on the investigative hours and to accelerate an investigation. And as I've said a couple of times, it, all of the results highlighted that need for the forensic biologist to interpret and deliver that intelligence to the detectives. So the outcome, um, we assess the MPS uh, as being operationally effective and we used those findings in a, in a successful business case, and we were lucky enough to be able to purchase our own MPS instruments, which you can see pictured there. And we're about to, <coughs> excuse me, we're about to commence the validation of those now. Uh, just some disclaimers, which you can consume in your own time. And I think we're holding questions to the end. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Mommy, you're, you're back on screen again. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah, this I'm is the nature of live telecasts. So can you pick off where you went or where, where we were before? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Sorry about that, folks. Um, technical difficulties with blue screen errors. So um, just to recap. So before I got cut off, I was talking about how we also had issues with consensus-based reporting and over-amplification artifacts on CE. So to address these concerns, we realized we needed to generate a lysate. So instead of snapping off the microflock head into a tube containing our master mix, it went into some low TE buffer and a short incubation to allow the live cell contents to enter the buffer. This provided us with sufficient volume for multiple amplifications using global filer and the option of varying the amount of lysate used for amplification. We evaluated this modification with blood stain on a wide variety of substrates and reported on the performance of this compared to our standard sample processing of cotton swabs of the blood stains on the different exhibit types. These box plots show the range in median peak heights in the DNA profiles obtained from blood on the different substrates. Straight away, we can see that there was much wider variation in RFU observed with modified microflock procedure because of the natural variation in template use for amplification because no quantitation was performed compared to the standard method. 
Overall, we obtained complete DNA profiles for the modified microflock across all the substrates with well-balanced sister peaks and the majority of peaks above our stochastic threshold. In the last two substrates, we observed that the modified microflock workflow was able to generate complete DNA profiles where our standard workflow failed to produce any reportable peaks. Here, we see an excerpt from the respective electropherograms. In the standard processing, there was no inhibition detected during quantitation. The internal positive control CT values were no different from other non-inhibited samples. We believe that the humic acid in the soil may have competitively sequestered the released DNA during extraction, and hence, there was no DNA eluted. On the left are photos showing what blood on the soil stained fabric and rock looked like. And so, in addition to the benefits highlighted earlier, and with a slight increase in processing time, we have also addressed the concerns of CE artifacts due to over-amplification and gained the ability to do replicate amplifications to allow consensus reporting of DNA profiles. By adopting this modified microflock direct amplification method, we have been able to do more with less. Moving on, I will next be sharing about ancestry prediction using YSDR DNA profiles. We have been doing prediction for biogeographic ancestry using ancestry informative markers genotyped on the Illumina massively parallel sequencing platform, using custom reference populations for the predominant Chinese, Malay, and Indian populations in Singapore, and using the online snipper tool. This has allowed us to predict ancestry with an accuracy of about 90%, and the ability to detect admixture between these ancestry groups when present at a 1 is to 1 up to a 3 is to 1 ratio. However, this capability required additional sample consumption, significant costs, and a 4 to 5 day wait for the MPS results. We know that Y haplogroups are biogeographically linked as you can see by the multiple colors associated with the different regions of the world. In our laboratories, we have already been performing YSDR DNA profiling for a number of years and for increasingly more case types. Analysis of YSDR profiles generated in our laboratory over the past few years showed that we had about 66,000 unique haplotypes from about 78,000 y filer plus DNA profiles. The frequency distribution of these haplotypes show that the majority, nearly three quarters, are seen only once, otherwise known as singletons. We use Shannon's entropy as a measure of information content between our populations in the y tested YCR loci. This is influenced by the proportion of alleles at each locus, if you look at the formula. We observe that the YSDR loci are quite rich in information content. From the bar plots, DYS385 and DYF387S1, both of which are multi-copy markers and so have the most number of alleles among the tested loci, also have the highest information content. We looked at linkage disequilibrium across the YSDR loci and observed that despite inclusion of rapidly mutating YSDR markers, the entire set of YSDR loci were all very strongly linked. The high degree of shared information that we saw in the previous slide, combined with the strong non-recombining properties of the loci and the generally reported low occurrence of mutation at between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 2 per generation meant that there was preservation of ethnicity information in the YSDR profiles, thus allowing them to be used for ancestry inference. We decided to use machine learning algorithms to model the differences in our local Chinese, Malay, and Indian populations. 
we didn't know how the YSDR would behave and didn't know which ones would work the best. And so we tried to cover most classes of machine learning algorithms, such as support vector classification, tree-based modeling with different boosting techniques, neural networks, and k-nearest neighbors. We further supplemented these algorithms with two additional classifying algorithms, which took input from the latter four models and gave a prediction either based on the majority, if you look at the voting classifier, or based on neural network modeling, if you look at the stacking classifier. While each of these machine learning algorithms had slightly different accuracies, they were generally able to lead to the same predictions. Five different algorithms leading to the same answer reinforced that the predictions were accurate at around 90% accuracy. And this was reiterated by the two classifier algorithms. So effectively, because we had already been performing YSTR DNA profiling on increasingly more case types, we were also able to do ancestry prediction using machine learning without any additional sample consumption, additional costs, or the typical four to five day wait for MPS results. And so we have succeeded in doing more with less. To continuously improve on our capabilities following this theme, we hope to expand the use of the modified microflock technique to include semen stains. And as well as to expand the use of the machine learning algorithms for ancestry prediction in other Asian populations. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. I would like to acknowledge HSA, the organization which I work for, for giving us the backing and opportunity to continue to be the National Forensic DNA Laboratory. Thermo Fisher for giving us the chance to share with all of you today and everyone from our laboratories who have contributed to the research and developments mentioned so far. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you very much. Excellent talk. We, we actually have uh, a couple of questions written for, for the panelists, um, which I've got online at the moment. Please, anyone else wanting to put questions in, do so. Now, we do actually have a question about what I think may have been answered halfway through the talk about the rapid DNA. What type of samples were collected at the, at the PM? Um, maybe Jeremy, do you answer that? So I talked about the, the nails and, and bone samples. Is there anything else like if you look at hair and other types of material which you may have talked about? Yeah, so I mean, we, we specifically focused on, on nails, either fingernails or toenails, depending on the availability, um, as well as the hair. Uh, we looked at the biopsy tissue, so just tissue, um, and then, yeah, the, the, a couple of different bones, specifically femur and, and uh, foot bones. There was a sort of follow-up question, which I can sort of summarise, which is, again, Jeremy, to you, you might as well take this one as well is what were the problems of trying to, say, pulverise bone in field? Was that feasible? Um, there were challenges, and and basically the situation was we were trying a range of different things, but we, we didn't necessarily find anything that, that worked the best. So that is something that we're, we're continuing to, to try to develop. We only had a couple of questions, but I'll just raise one because we've got a few seconds. Um, and maybe Luke or Dr. Amani might take this. If we've got a lot of, uh, or any Jody and Ali actually, you're talking a lot about intelligence. Now, what would be the hurdles of transitioning this from intelligence? Because I mean, a lot of areas of forensic science started off in intelligence and then somehow ended up in court. Um, so, what would be any of the issues if you wanted to transition this into real casework? Uh, let's try Luke first. Um, can you hear me, Luke? Sorry, I think I was muted. You got me now? You, you yeah. can hear me now. I think Yep, I think, look, I think the big difference uh, is uh, that the STR analysis 
has has some really good statistical analysis uh, that can be used to provide likelihood ratios and and can be used in court to explain the evidence. Um, at the moment, the NPS just doesn't have that. There's the I guess the the extent of it at the moment are like I had in those intelligence reports, those likely and not likely statements. So I think that that's a that's a big limitation in its utility in a court setting at the moment. What about yourself, Dr. Romani? Is there an issue in Singapore? Well, the biggest issue here is acceptance by the courts. So, um, we, the acceptance. It, it, well, it's not really a problem. It has not been approached yet. Well, I mean, b even before acceptance by the courts, we first have to look at validation. While validation, while some laboratories have started doing validation, guidelines are not confirmed, they're not ratified yet. Next, fair we need to look at testing of a large number of samples to demonstrate robustness and reproducibility. This is still in process right now. And moving forward, so this being able to do this large number of samples will help us demonstrate to others, as the community, as well as the courts, the robustness and the reproducibility of the system. And ultimately, in the end, education to the court officials to understand what we are doing and what the results mean. And together with these education, we also need to talk about what the limitations in the technology are. All this needs to come together before we as a community are ready to be able to transition this from purely investigative work over to casework. Well, I think direct PCR is something I know a little bit about myself, and uh, the issues are often about reproducibility. I think we're going to wrap that up very soon. So uh, unless anyone else got anything particular to to bring into the conversation, uh, I was told to try and make sure we finished about around about three o'clock. And uh, well, three o'clock my time. <laughs> I think it's three o'clock, 3.30, someone else's time. And goodness knows what time it is elsewhere. So can I hold a hand back to um, Beatrice? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for all the speakers and, and um, Adrian for um, being the chair of this session. Um, we have a short video for you to play. Um, Christy, if we can play Peter's video right now. Hello, this is Peter Waterman. I'm the global commercial leader for the Thermo Fisher Scientific HID team. It's been wonderful to have been involved in the very first fully virtual HIDS meeting this year. I've heard a lot about these meetings over the years and to have now experienced and seen the presentations, the posters, the panel discussions and the trade shows has reinforced to me the true value of building interactions and a sense of community and partnership in HID across the world. The theme of this year's meeting is actually partnership in criminal justice. This resonates strongly, especially during these challenging times when interaction, communication and support of each other is so important. It has been an eye-opener to me how the HID community can overcome these challenges and create a truly wonderful virtual event. Thank you to all of you, the over 2,000 registrants and attendees who have truly made this a mem memorable occasion. I would like to thank in particular the session presenters, the panellists, the moderators, the poster presenters. You delivered significant scientific value, one that actually parallels an in-person event in many ways. I would also like to thank the Thermo Fisher scientific team who have worked to bring this event together. Thank you for the standard that you have set. It is a standard that we hope to meet and exceed in future meetings. Back to the attendees, I'd like to ask you for a, a favour. Your input, your feedback is so important to us to continue to make this event uh, useful and also um, valuable to all of you. Your suggestions, your ideas, your feedback are incredibly important to us. Please send those to us. We hope next year, fingers crossed, 
we might be able to meet in person. But in the meantime, we wish you all of the safety, all of the best health to you, your families and your colleagues. And we look forward to talking to you and meeting you again very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. Let me echo his thanks to all of you who have uh, joined us for this day. Um, it's been lovely having all of you around in this virtual environment. I, I do hope we'll bump into each other into the corridors again. But right now, the 24 hours of HITS Virtual 2020 is drawing to a close. I do hope it was as memorable for you as it was for me. Um, don't worry about missing any presentations. These presentations from our session and the sessions earlier are all available on demand viewing up until June 2021. So please be sure to stop by again and have a look at the rest of the sessions. Thank you once again for your participation. We are now going to open the technical Ask the Expert chat. And that's in the um, Ask the Expert chat hall. Um, that's only going to be open for two hours, so don't miss it. At the same time, the applications and exhibition booth and posters halls are still open, so please be sure to stop by. So thank you once again for your participation here. See you at HITS 2021. Signing off.